Hello, hello, everyone. I'm your host. My name is Corey Hall, and I am here in very snowy Portland, Oregon. Um, it's good to have you guys. I see people saying hi in the chat. We've got Jack, Penny, um, Ashraful, Alejandro. Thank you for joining us. If you stuck around after Andrew's live stream, thank you for sticking around. Um, this is episode one of a four-part series that I am doing called Teaching Typography. Um, and in this series, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be learning about four different fundamentals of typography that have been pretty integral in my practice as a graphic designer. Um, and we're going to be taking those fundamentals and turning them into four separate posters. Um, hi, Barbara. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Jack, it is snowy here. Jack, I think, are you in Texas? Remind me, because I think there's also snow in Texas. Um, but it's very cold here. I'm actually wearing two pairs of socks and Uggs as I'm sitting here at my desk. Um, but back to what I was saying. So four posters, four different fundamentals of typography over the next two months. Um, this is a four part series. Um, and so what I will be doing is we're going to be breaking it down into those four different fundamentals. And then we're just going to go kind of in depth on each of what them um, in each of the sort of one hour live streams that I'll be doing over the next couple of months. Um, so before I dive into today's fundamental, um, I'll just share a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Corey Hall. Um, this is my website. Um, spent a lot of time designing this website. I hope you guys like it. You can check it out at CoreyAllenHall.com. Um, but it's got this really cool sort of like dual scroll design on it that I spent a fair amount of time on. But Again, about me, my name is Corey Hall. My pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary designer, artist. Um, I do a fair amount of educational live streaming. Um, and I also am currently working as a full-time um, senior designer at Stanford University. Um, but before that, I have worked at various different branding and packaging firms. I've worked at a digital pub publishing startup. I've worked for local governments. I've worked for small businesses. I've worked for big tech companies. Um, and so I have spent a lot of time, I spent the last nine years working a lot with typography, a lot in graphic design. Um, and so I would definitely call myself a professional graphic designer, um, but I am by no means an authority on graphic design. And so we're just going to kind of be going through these fundamentals today um, in a light, bright, fun sort of way. Um, Barbara is in Nashville, 18 degrees. Yeah, I think it's 16 degrees here in Portland right now, which is like really cold for Portland. <laughs> um, yeah, we're definitely not used to the snow. Uh, we've got one snowplow for the entire city of Portland, which is like bananas. Um, so yes, that's a bit about me. Um, if you would like to get in touch, I've got an email button down here. I've got my social links down at the bottom here as well. Um, if you click on the YouTube link, you can see the other live streams that I've done with Adobe Live. I've been streaming with Adobe Live now for years. Um, but let's go over to the teaching typography tab. Um, and this is sort of where I break down a little bit about what we're going to be doing in this four part series um, here on Adobe Live. So like I mentioned, each episode, I'm going to be working on one poster that is going to highlight some fundamental piece or part of typography that I have found really helpful um, to either understand or have a good grasp of in my own uh, graphic design practice. Um, so the four uh, different fundamentals that I've broken this up into, um, number one, typographic anatomy. So what are the different parts of a letter? What are they called? How do they function? How do they come together to form a cohesive typeface or a cohesive design system um, to share a specific message? Um, episode number two is typographic structure. So how can you structure your typography either with a visual grid um, or with improvised grids to help make sure that your type is reading um, in a way that makes sense or is at least telling a really compelling story. Um, the third episode is going to be typographic semantics. Um, so, and you can see here on the right hand side of the screen, I've got sort of the each detailed breakdown of each episode. How can you tell a story or convey a message using typography? So like using language, using the shapes and forms of typography, how do we pull those things together? Um, to convey meaning or to evoke a feeling. Um, and then finally, part four, um, typographic hierarchy. So how can you use hierarchy in your designs with your typography to make sure that the message that you're telling is, um, is reading correctly, is reading in the right order, is saying what you want it to say? Um, and something that I think is really cool and interesting about typography is that obviously typogra or typography is... Um, used for conveying a specific message through words and through letters or um, characters or shapes. Um, but typo typography can also be used as a design element. So type doesn't necessarily need to be legible um, in order for it to be an effective communicator. 
And so we'll kind of get into a little bit of that in later episodes, but in this episode in particular, we're going to be looking at really typographic anatomy. What are the different parts of a letter or um, like one character in the alphabet um, and how do those come together to form a more cohesive um, and legible typeface? So without further ado, I'm going to switch over to Adobe Illustrator. Um, this is where we're going to be working today. Um, and I've pulled together a variety of different typefaces, um, all of which are ones that I either like, a couple of them are brand new to me, but a few of them are ones that I kind of fall back onto that I lean heavily on in my own design practice. Um, we've got a really classic one up here, Adobe Garamond, which is based on Garamond, which is like a very old typeface based on, um, that's around the Roman, um, alphabet, but it is sort of one of the, like, tried and true, very original um, serif typefaces. Um, Sway variable, that's kind of a fun or chunky um, serif typeface. Um, Punto, I don't really even know how to say that, but these are all just some of my favorite fonts. I pulled them all from Adobe Fonts, so you will have access to them. Oh, and something else I would like to mention is that on my website, um, on the episode and links page, you can download the design file that I'll be working with today. So if you would like to create a different version or your own version of the poster that we're making today, you can download the template. Um, it's an Illustrator template there, um, as well as a couple of other additional resources that I found to be really helpful um, in my own design practice. Uh, so going back to Illustrator, um, these are, you know, here are some other sort of typefaces that I'm thinking about playing around with, as well as a color palette pre-selected, you'll notice that it is also the same color palette that I've used in the designs for the branding of this teaching typography course. Um, I'm just going to stick with this color palette. I really like it. It's bright and happy. Kind of makes me feel like it isn't winter here in Portland. Um, and then finally, I've just got a bunch of vocabulary words. Um, I find these to be really helpful to just kind of like fall back onto if I'm just like blanking on what something is called. Um, this is just going to be kind of our cheat sheet. Um, tiny doodles, good to have those good old reliables. Yep, I could not agree more. I sometimes lean too much on certain typefaces and I find myself needing to break away from them. Um, but it's good to have those ones to just know are a safe bet. If you're looking for a sans serif, you've got a safe bet for your sans serif and uh, for a serif typeface or a display typeface or a decorative typeface, which I would say like, I don't know, this one here, find replace, pretty decorative, not super legible. Um, same with Punto. So what I have done is I have gone ahead and gotten started on this type anatomy poster. Um, so again, today what we're focusing on is the anatomy of typefaces. What are the various bits and pieces that come together to form a typeface? What are they called? Um, and how do they sort of function to create something that's more cohesive? Um, this is actually sort of a fun fact. Back when I was in design school, back in 2014 is when I started uh, studying graphic design. This was one of my first assignments um, in my first typography class was to create a type anatomy poster. So that was the inspiration behind this initial episode here. Um, Jack Watson loved the variety of font styles. Yes, I completely agree. We're going to be playing with that variety today here on this poster. Um, but this was my first assignment um, in my first typography class in graphic design school back in 2014 was creating a poster very similar to this. Um, and so this is like a really good and helpful poster that I have found myself falling back onto many, many times over the last nine years of um, designing. So we've got, you can see um, various parts of the letter are circled. Then they've got this little key that tells you, okay, so like, what is this shape right here? Go down, check number four. Um, and that is called the terminal. Um, and you can see here that we've got a terminal on the letter A, we've got a terminal on the letter F. So terminal is a very common part of a serif typeface. Um, but let's see, something that's a little bit more specific, a little bit more nuanced might be this shape here um, on the G, on the lowercase G, number 20, um, that is return stroke. So that is like only ever going to exist on this type of letter G. Um, so again, I found this to just be like a really, really helpful um, piece of guidance for uh, my own typographic practice and being able to reference back to if I'm curious about something. Um, and then kind of thinking more broadly about typefaces um, and about like a particular font. Um, 
other important sort of terminology to know baseline is the letter or is the line um, that all of the letters sit on. So if you were to, let's see, if I were to take this line of type, I'm going to duplicate it over here. If you zoom in and I'm again in Adobe Illustrator, you can see the baseline is actually illustrated right here for you. So you can tell exactly where the baseline is. And that's just really helpful for making sure that your type is aligned, even if you're using different fonts. Um, aligning the baseline, and I'll zoom in really, really close here, you can see that I've aligned the baseline to this dotted line right here. Um, making sure the baseline is aligned is really pretty key to making sure that your type is legible, um, if it is your goal to make your type legible, which it could not be. Um, and then X height is the height of um, sort of, if. Well, let's see, let's go down to the X in particular, which is where the name X height comes from. It is the height of a lowercase X. It also happens to be the height of um, any sort of lowercase character. And you can see that certain letters um, like the C or the A, um, the B, they do dip beneath the, um, the baseline of the typography. And that is really just kind of to help with legibility. This comes from back when letters and typography was set on um, letter presses. Um, these are practices that have been around for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, maybe not thousands and thousands, but like many, many, many um, hundreds of years, um, over a thousand years. Um, as letters have been printed onto various forms of parchment and paper, um, these these sort of like letter forms and the baselines have been determined by what looks and prints best. And then as we move over into um, writing digitally on computers, um, we are able to like adjust based on legibility based on a computer screen versus on printing. Um, finally here, cap height. Um, this is the height of a uh, uppercase letter um, or capitalized letter. Um, so here we have just generally bigger poster um, and something that I think that I thought would be really cool and fun to do is we have, I'm set all of these letters in Adobe Garamond right now, very traditional font. Again, like I've mentioned, it's been around for a really long time. Um, but in order to show how consistent all of these various parts of a letter are across um, different fonts, different typefaces, I'm going to begin setting these different typographic guidelines in different fonts. Um, Jack, need to know, need this in my life so I can stop saying, you know, the squiggly part of a G. Exactly. And to be completely honest with you, I still very much say the squiggly part of a G or, you know, that little curvy bit from the top of the end, just because it's really hard to recall. There are like way more than 32 different um, parts to a letter. These are sort of the 32 like top ones that I've come across and found. But we can start saying, instead of this little squiggly ear part of the end, you can say the pod hook. So, you know, it's good to know. It's fun to know. Um, but by no means is this like the only way to refer to these various parts of a letter. We can, I don't know, I believe design is flexible. We should kind of be able to say and do what we want with design um, and not stick super strictly to all the rules. Um, so. I've broken out my file here into various different layers. I've got the typography layer. I've got the key, um, which is down here at the bottom. I've got the numbers, the reference numbers, the guides, the type grid, um, and the header and footer, as well as the framing. And so in order to kind of make this a more interesting and compelling poster, of course, we're going to add color to it. Um, I'll start by adding color to sort of the containing elements. Um, and I'm going to go back to my reference file where all of my typefaces are. And I'm going to create a separate um, library for my teaching typography series. So I'm just going to do this really fast. Um, if y'all are not familiar with libraries within Adobe Creative Cloud, I highly recommend using them. Um, I find them to be super helpful. They sync across all of your devices. They sync across Adobe um, Express. Um, and so if you're adding graphics, colors, fonts to these libraries in Illustrator, they'll pop over um, as you're working in Express on your desktop or on your um, web browser. So I'm going to call this um, Teaching Typography. And this is a new library. So I'm going to select this first orange color. I'm going to add it as a fill color into my new library. And I'm just going to go ahead and do this for all of them. 
so that I have them sitting in this little library for me. And if I wanted to, I could add these fonts, but I'm not gonna do that right now. And there we go, it's in my library over here in my other file. And I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of start making some slight design tweaks to this file to give it a little bit more color, to give it a little bit more personality um, before we start going in and switching up the typography because I want to look at a pretty document while I am playing around with it. Okay, so we've got some colors starting to come through. And in order to start changing these, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna hide some of my other elements just so that we aren't distracted as I'm switching out some of these typefaces. Um, so Garamond, like I've mentioned three or four times now, such a classic typeface. I'm gonna leave that as the letter A just because it's kind of a good starting point. It's good um, to demonstrate the different pieces of um, a letter form. And then for this one, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over here, sway variable, and I'm going to do a nice lowercase a. Um, and actually, you know what? Maybe we will leave these reference points just so that we can see what parts of the letter we're referencing. And I will need to go through and move around some of these graphics once I've um, selected all of my different typefaces. Um, for the letter B, what is the one? I think it was Punto. Yep. So we're going to do Punto for this one. Um, maybe we'll leave that one for now. Um, again, I'm going to leave Adobe Garamond for this one, but I think I'm going to make it italic just for a little bit. Maybe Adobe... Garamond. Italic just for a little bit of extra movement. If we're going to keep the same typeface as in the letter, um, as in the first line, and in the second line, we want a little bit of differentiation in there. Um, and then I'm going to go New Spirit for this one. Ooh. And what's interesting is as I am adjusting these typefaces, you can see that because they're different typefaces, they have different X heights and different cap heights, um, different baselines even, or when I switch typefaces, it changes the baseline, or the baseline doesn't change itself, but you can see that the other characters around it start to adjust um, to accommodate. Um, and this is just like an important thing to understand about typefaces is that every typeface has a different X height, has a different cap height. The proportions between X height and cap height are completely different, um, and so, it's not consistent and it's fully based um, stylistically on how the typeface itself is designed. So if I were to go and see, you know, the difference between Oh No Blaze Face and New Spirit, you can see that the X height, the difference between the X height and the cap height um, on New Spirit is much uh, bigger than it is um, on Oh No Blaze Face. And so I'm going to need to make adjustments to my template here once I've got all my typefaces selected. Um, and let's see for this one, I think, oh no, blaze face is the one that I want to use on the letter E. Oh no, I'm gonna move over here. And I wanna pick one with a fair amount of contrast because the different parts of this letter that are being called out, I think is like a better point served with a more higher contrasted letter form. Um, even, oh, honestly, that's really cool and wild, but it doesn't quite make as much sense for, for this letter and the different pieces that we're calling out. Um, the letter E, hmm, I think we're going to go over here, find her place. That is the name of this one. And again, these are all available on Adobe Fonts, um, which is really cool. You know, I think like I really gravitate, I find myself gravitating more towards super experimental and like weird typefaces. Um, and so I just really love that on Adobe Fonts, there are like so many different types of not just really traditional typefaces, but some really, really cool, fun display ones or completely even illegible ones. Um, like 
This one is super bizarre. This says teaching typography and it's like, I don't know, really kind of difficult to read. Like if you didn't know that this is what it said, then I don't think you would be able to read it. But it's called Eco. It lives on Adobe Fonts. Go check it out. Um, and you know, you never know when you could do this. It could work more as a design element than as a legible piece of a poster anyway. So definitely check those out. Okay, we're going over to the letter G. Um, and I think, what font do we want to use? Sway again, we're going to do Sway again. Thank you, Jack, for dropping in the Adobe Fonts link to the chat. Um, that is fonts.adobe.com. Um, and to do to do. We're missing a letter. There we go. And we've got our P. I don't know. I think I want to make the P something. What is a good? That's kind of an interesting P. Let's see if we can make this work. Shuriken. Shuriken boy. And again, I'm ooh, fully adjusting. I'm going to need to adjust, make adjustments to all of these letter sizes so that they all align within the X height and the cap height that I have set in the guides here. Uh, but we will get to that in a little bit. Um, okay, I think having a scripty font here is great. Um, again, part of the reason that I'm choosing a bunch of different fonts for this um, Sweet fancy script. Yeah. Part of the reason I'm choosing a bunch of different fonts for this is really kind of just to demonstrate that the basic anatomy and structure of type is pretty consistent across many, many different typefaces. And so that's kind of why I find it helpful to, um, to learn a little bit more about this construction um, because really these like this terminology and these um, various pieces exist across the gambit of typography. Okay, so now we've got like a really kind of crazy looking alphabet here. Um, that is a super squiggly G. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Honestly, this G is like really freaking cool. I'm kind of obsessed with it. I like, I don't think I would be able to write with Sway very often or like design with Sway very often because it is like so big and so bold. Like if I go typography and we do sway, it's just like a kooky typeface um, and it's super stylistic, but having it work as more of a decorative element than anything else, like how it functions in this poster, um, I think is like really, really cool. Um, okay, so we've got all of our different letters. I'm gonna go through and just kind of start making sure baselines are aligning again and I'm going to start resizing. So the way that I'm going to do that is do to do using some keyboard shortcuts. Um, and what I'm using right now is shift command. Um, I guess it's the little, oh, it's a comma. It's a comma. Oh, hi, Oliver. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm using my keyboard shortcuts to make the type bump the typeface up by Let's see, two point sizes is the current setting that my keyboard shortcuts are set to. Baseline is aligned, the A, X height is aligned. So I'm gonna move on to B, move that down just slightly, get that cap height aligned. And I think this B looks pretty good. Um, so fun little thing, this ascender right here, this nine is pointing to the ascender of the B and the ascenders um, usually, not always, but usually extend above the cap height um, of whatever typeface um, that letter is a part of. So that's just a good fun little thing to know. This C is way too tall um, for this X height in proportion to the other letters that is around. So I'm gonna bump it down. Um, even though, like I mentioned, C's, A's, B's, P's um, do typically bump a little bit below and above the X height. So 
again, this line, this very thin blue line right here is the baseline. Even though the letters do kind of bump below and above, um, it shouldn't be too, too much. And so that's why I brought the size down a little bit. We've got our E, I'm gonna bump this up so that it's at the cap height. Like that, this letter E is too big, bringing that down. And because this is a pretty square and boxy, clever. So no, we are not doing ransom notes, even though I can absolutely see why you would think that. Um, we are creating um, a type anatomy poster. And so what we're looking at right now is a part one in a four part series, um, making posters for different fundamentals of typography. Um, so today's poster is uh, an anatomy poster in which we are looking at the various letter forms and the parts of those letter forms um, that come together to create a cohesive um, shape letter form um, and what those various pieces are called. It's a little bit all over the place right now. I'm going to need to readjust some of these shapes, um, but that is what we're doing. But this could absolutely double as a ransom note, and if it was a ransom note, um, or if it was used as a ransom note, I think I would be a little bit scared instead of very intrigued, um, like how I am right now with this design. Um, okay. I think F and G can both definitely come down in size. Oliver. I don't know, Clever, do you need help creating a ransom note? And if you do, I would definitely need to ask why. Um, I hope you're not ransoming anybody, but if you are, I wouldn't expect you to admit to it in the chat, live on the internet. Honestly, that would be a really fun design project is creating a like cool, well-designed ransom note that, I don't know, maybe I'll, however, if you give me permission at least, maybe I will use that in an upcoming Adobe Live at some point, um, because I kind of love that idea. There is like something very cool and graphic about ransom notes. Um, and like, even just like the concept of creating a ransom note, because I think that the point of a ransom note really is that it's untrackable, like it's not able to be tied to someone's handwriting or even really tied to like, I don't know, a computer or a typewriter. It is like truly fully pulled from like so many different sources that it's untrackable. And that in itself is just like a really cool um, design concept. Like as I'm saying that aloud, I'm like, oh wow, I'm actually like kind of obsessed with that as a design concept. That is like super cool. Um, Cause I do love collaging. Collaging is like super fun. And it kind of takes me back to my OG design school days when I was doing it for the fun and a little bit less for the work and for whatever company I was working for. Um, and just kind of like messing around and going with my gut, like, I don't know, designing instinctually. There's something for me about designing with my hands or designing with a piece of paper or designing with scissors that feels a lot more instinctual. There's less room for me to like overthink it or there's less room for like, I guess, margin of error. And so if I am like, if I do mess up, there's like, it, you can't go back quite as easily. Um, okay, this Y is cuckoo bananas because let's see, this is a funny example. And I like, I'm not going to pretend to really super understand the, um, I don't know, the science behind this one letter form versus another as it relates to like an italic scripted Y versus an X. But what's crazy is that this Y is now, I'm trying desperately to get this Y to meet the X height of the letters around it. And in order to do that, I needed to go, let's see, how big is this Y? 379, whereas this Y next to it is 201. So there's probably something there that, um, about why that why needs to be so much bigger because of the script and like legibility wise why needs to be so much bigger um i'm gonna bring all these letters bring them a little bit closer together um kern them that is and so let's see a good little keyboard shortcut that i'm using now is um for kerning option left and right arrow um option 
left arrow brings the two letters closer together and option right arrow brings them further apart. Um, and I'm just doing it sort of like optically um, based on how it looks the best. Okay, so I think that I've got all of my letters pretty much aligning where they need to. All the baselines are aligned. Um, all the X heights are aligned about where they should be for each of these typefaces. Oh, Alan Hall, my dad is in the YouTube chat and he says mosaic. I can see the mosaic, especially for this letter E. It is like definitely giving mosaic. Thanks for stopping by, dad. Um, Alan, fun fact. Corey Allen Hall is my full name. Alan is my middle name. My dad's um, first name is Alan. His middle name is his dad's name. I think that's actually where the lineage stops. Um, or I don't know, should I say tradition or something? Um, but Clever says, hi, dad. Okay, so we have the key. We have the numbers. I'm really glad that I separated this all into different layers. Okay, I'm going to change the color of my type grid because these grays are like super boring and are making me kind of sad. And I'm gonna go for kind of like really bold colors. Yellow and red, that is like crazy bold. Um, we probably don't want them to be that bold just because I don't want them to distract too much from the overall point of this poster, which is to help demonstrate the um, various parts of a letter. So I'm going to bring the opacity down on all of them. And I'm going to bring the opacity down here too. I'm going to bring it down maybe, I don't know, 50 seems like a lot. So I'm going to bring it down maybe 40. Okay. I like how Jack and my dad are saying hi to each other in the YouTube chat. That is very cute. Okay, so we've got type grid. I don't know. For now, I think that that works. Um, and then I'm going to change the color of the guides. So that is these dotted lines here. I'm going to just go ahead and select all of them, all of the guides. And I'm going to make the stroke. Oop. Gonna make it red. Yeah, okay, those are red. And funny, I'm not sure why, we're also not selecting those background lines. Are they locked? They are locked, okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna select all of these now. Also make those red. And I'm gonna just use this little eyedropper tool. Just kidding, because it wants to select the typography. Okay, red. Um, oh, now my mom is in the Adobe live chat. Hi, mom. Thank you for being here. She said she just liked the sound of Corey Allen, never thought about the lineage. So we have a full, we've got some typographic history happening here, and we've got some Corey Hall family history happening here as well. Um, thanks, parents, for joining. Okay, so we've got, wow, this is already making just like such a major difference in the look and feel of this poster from the black and white, black and white version to this one here already looks like a thousand times better. Um, and I'm going to go back to my typography, not dig in the black. We're going to, oops, we're going to make it blue, maybe even. Okay. I love the way that that looks, but it is definitely illegible. Um, so we're going to make it dark blue, man, but that's, Ooh, I really liked that. I don't really know what this color is called. Like, I don't know, kind of like a sea foamy green, maybe. Okay, numbers, we're going to change the color of all of the numbers here, make them red so that they match um, the red dotted lines all around it, um, as well as the key. And I think in this case, we can make this key red so it matches, maybe. 
Although, is that a little bit hard to read? Do, do, do. I think it's okay for now. Um, and then this key, let's go ahead and make this. Man, I'm just a sucker for red type. I don't know about y'all. Maybe it's like my design school days. So something that, I don't know, my design, um, graphic design teachers, and especially typography teachers really pounded into us was um, sort of like the Swiss school of thought for graphic design, which is, uh, I guess I would say like a very dominant school of thought for graphic design. Um, Bauhaus, German design, even kind of like brutalist, um, um, like Russian sort of like communist style of design is feels kind of derivative of Swiss design. But these like bright, bold reds are super popular in um, those sort of like schools of design. And maybe that's why I always sort of lean towards reds in my design. Um, Probably good to break away from that a little bit. Maybe blue. Yeah, blue's more legible. It is more legible. Although I do like red a lot. Okay. Um, and maybe these should be blue too, because they're both acting as the key, um, if you will. Um, I guess using that train of thought though, then maybe these should also be blue, but I like them red. Okay. So I'm going to start sort of pulling these over um, and making sure they align with the right parts of the letters. Um, and as we do that, guides, where's my guide? There we go. Okay, I'm going to lock these background lines so that I don't accidentally pick them up. Okay. So I'm going to start pulling these over. And we're going to see if the letters that I chose actually make sense for um, these different typographic terminologies. Um, so this number one is looking at the crossbar of the A. Um, and again, I think that almost all of this vocabulary works for or my goal, I guess I should say, is um, that I am picking letters where this typography or this uh, vocabulary will work for um, whatever typeface I'm choosing. But like almost any capital A is going to have a crossbar, whether it's New Spirit, whether it's Oh No Blaze Face, whether it's Find and Replace, whether it's Sway, um, even Sweet Fancy Script. Um, this has um, a crossbar, although, do to do. Um, Swash, fancy, a fancy flourish replacing a terminal R, Sarah. Okay, so that's not exactly what it is, but I guess it's just a fancy um, crossbar. Um, so we're gonna go pull this one over here. Um, this would be the weighted diagonal, um, is this sort of like diagonal shape, um, or sorry, this three is the weighted diagonal. Um, and then this is the, uh, diagonal hairline because it's thinner and this these two pieces these two um call outs are really only good for this particular sans serif typeface or sorry serif typeface um number six we're gonna bump over and what is a number six and six is two-story roman a there you go that is a two-story a um, let's get this four over here and I called out a four earlier. I believe that the four that I called out before was the terminal. Five. Let's see, what's the five? The lobe which would be referring here to this part where it gets a little bit thicker um, at the lower part of the A. Okay, that's looking good, nice and aligned. Uh, do, do, do. Number seven, straight stem um, for this letter B. That is exactly what it is. Um, and then 
this here is the counter. So number eight is pointing towards the counter. And basically what a counter is, is it's any enclosed or partially enclosed part of a letter. Um, so it could be this little bit of the A, it could be this part of the B, it could be do to do, it could be this C here is also a counter. Um, so it doesn't have to be fully enclosed, but it is mainly partially enclosed. Um, oh, Allison Felt is in the chat. Hi, Allison. Allison is a good friend of mine and was a coworker at one point. Um, I love Allison. Thank you for coming. So yeah, um, counter, that's like a pretty ubiquitous term for um, term and like part of a letter that you can find in a lot of different letter forms. Um, that's a counter. That's a counter. That's a counter. So I'm obviously not going to put an eight on every single one, but I put an eight on the B and on the C to demonstrate that a counter can be enclosed fully or can be partially enclosed. Um, okay, we're going to go over here to this nine. And this is the ascender, as I mentioned earlier, um, and it's called an ascender because it ascends up away from the um, sort of like primary body of the letter form. Um, and ascenders don't always, but oftentimes ascend beyond the cap height of um, whatever typeface you're working with, um, as you can see it doing right here. 10, this is a spur. This is a very specific little part of the letter. Um, so, you know, it's definitely like the lowercase b in this um, typeface would not have a spur, but um, Adobe Garibon, because this is a more traditional typeface, it's got that little spur. Okay, we're gonna do over here. and overshot. That is called a thin or a hairline. Mm, it's not specific to the letter C. Oh my God, Yu Young's in the chat. Hi, Yu Young. BFF, Portland BFF over here. Thanks for stopping by my work from home, buddy. Oh my God, everywhere is queer is here. I love this. Um, Okay, wait, hold on. I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Clever, um, do you have to keep to an M space or an N space when considering the width side to side? Um, I'm not sure, Clever. I'm not sure if I understand the question completely when considering the width side to side. I mean, that is probably a very specific question for designing a typeface. Um, and I am not entirely sure the answer to that question. Um, some A's have a dot if it is stylized. Most A glyphs are evil triangles. Um, need a floating cheat sheet reference for this work. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay. That is kind of what we're working on today is the floating cheat sheet reference. And we're going to keep moving this over. Oh, everywhere is queer is learning so much. Hi, Charlie. Thanks for joining. Um, okay. Popping this over here. Yeah, so clever. I took a font design or a typeface design class um, during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I took it with, oh, let's see. Um, gosh, what is the name of? There is a typography archive organization based in San Francisco. I think it's literally called like type archive or something, but I signed up for this class pre pandemic. Um, it was supposed, it was started off in person um, and then it moved to online. And it was like I mentioned a type design class. Um, it was super cool, super informational. I learned a lot about like various letter forms and shapes um, more than I like possibly learn, could have ever possibly learned in um, design school. I found it to be extremely challenging and definitely not for me. Um, type design is like such an art. It requires like such detail-oriented focus. 
Um, and like a really holistic understanding of letter forms and characters and shapes that I just like quite personally do not have the patience for. Thank you, Jack. Letter form archive. That is exactly what it is. Um, it's yes, based in San Francisco. They are an excellent resource for um, pretty much all things typography. They've got tons and tons of historical scans of um, many, many different like old brochures, books, posters. Um, and like I mentioned, they have really, really great classes. Um, the type design course that I took, I really enjoyed it. Um, they had several like pop-in guests. One of them was, I think his name is James Edmondson, who is behind, um, behind Ono Type Foundry. Um, he does like cuckoo crazy fonts. So I'm just going to go to fonts.adobe.com and show you, um, sign in. Do to do. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy topic. I mean, it's it's really great. It's really fun. It's just definitely not for me. It's like so much detail oriented focus and I just don't have the patience for. Um, let me go to foundries. Let's go. Oh, no. Uh, uh, uh. So this type design class that I took, like I said, had special guests. And one of the guests, um, he was like a guest judge who was coming in and like critiquing our typefaces that we were designing. Um, James Edmondson, Ono Type Co. Um, he was judging my typeface and oh my God. He like, I remember he liked it, but he was like, this is crazy typeface. Um, and to hear someone who makes like these typefaces call my typeface crazy, he meant it in a good way. But um, I was definitely like, okay, I need to like rein this typeface in a little bit because it is definitely all over the place and like very illegible. Um, so anyways, this is this is some of his work and he just does like really, really cool, um, very beautiful, very unique typefaces that I'm sure um, a lot of designers, graphic designers have seen. Um, but yeah, that's that was my foray into type design and the last time that I think I will ever get into any sort of type design. Definitely not for me. Um, Umicorn says, have a podcast-like playlist for tomorrow with today's streams, I think. Huh. I don't know what you're saying. Jack Watson, I think Ono has a class now too. Yeah, that makes sense. That is like very much, I think, that like makes sense that he would be doing that. Allison says this chat is full of top fans and I couldn't agree more. So grateful for my community for showing up for me in the chat. Um, okay. We're just cranking away here, getting these little guys all set because we are, as usual, approaching time, which is crazy. We've already flown through an hour long live stream. Um, this is gonna go on the shoulder. I think number 12 is a shoulder. Yep, 12, shoulder. Um, a lot of typefaces have shoulders. Shoulder is not specific to the letter N. That circle is also a little small. Let's make it a little bigger to really demonstrate. Nope, there we go. Um, we're doing this like that. Cool, the P. This P is probably not a very good P to use because it is not going to have, um, I think the parts of the letter that we really need. So I am going to make it back to Adobe Garamond for now. Garamond, because it is such sort of a classic typeface, it is a great typeface for demonstrating the various parts of a letter because um, it is one that many, 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 many typefaces have been based around over the years, as well as it has been based on very many typefaces. Um, and it's like widely considered by some to be sort of like a perfected version of many different um, serif typefaces. Do-do-do. 
Okay. Finishing up with the X. I think this is called a waste, number 21. Yep, waste. We love that. That is like a fun little term. Um, and interestingly, I mean, maybe not so interestingly, but a lot of this terminology does come from um, or is, you know, based off of like human anatomy, um, lobe, beak, not human, but like you know what I mean? Shoulder, arm, eye, um, waist. Um, just because, you know, I think like anatomy as a whole is a broadly understood or like um, universally understood um, system. And so basing the terminology around human anatomy feels like a really good way to make it um, understandable and accessible to people. Um, but letters were also kind of designed with human anatomy in mind. Um, you know, if you think back to like hieroglyphics, um, like very, very old writing systems, um, the way that people wrote out ideas and communicated ideas, um, either through like pictography or iconography, um, it would make sense that as like writing systems and letter systems have evolved over time they are like slightly derivative to those um pictography systems and ways of communicating um that relied on sort of more human recognizable anatomy okay so i think we've got a lot of those different call outs aligned now and our poster is looking really pretty good I think one additional piece is I'm going to add a grid to this here because we've got the grid system um, serving of the function of showing us a different um, baseline X height and cap height. I think echoing that grid system in this key down below will it's just kind of a nice design touch. So I went over to the line tool um, and slid down over into the rectangular grid tool. Um, this is one that I use like really quite often. Um, and the way, hold on, let me exit out of that. The way that I would use this, we've got eight different um, numbers in this key. We'll want eight different, one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll want eight different Um, oh, too many. One, two, three, four, five. Concentrating, which is why I'm so quiet. Okay. One less. Okay, so what I'm doing and the way that I'm using this sort of grid system tool is I am like keeping the grid selected, I'm dragging out, and then I'm hitting the up and down arrow keys to add lines here um, to the grid. Um, oop. But it's not working. Okay, cool. Oh, and you know what? I don't want any horizontal grids. And Jack is in the chat saying we are approaching the last 10 minutes. If there are any last minute questions, um, feel free to shoot them over in the chat. Uh, would love to hear from you. If not, we can also take questions um, in the next Adobe Live that I will be doing, which is, like I mentioned, in two weeks, um, so today's teaching typography was about, um, type anatomy. The next one will be about, um, uh, boop, 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 going back over here, typographic structure. Um, so we kind of like started looking at a grid system here in this poster. Um, but in the next session, 
we'll be looking primarily at grid systems um, as opposed to typography um, anatomy and how we can use grids to structure typography and send a message that, um, or make sure that your message that you're sending is nice and clear and is well structured. Um, and kind of using, I mean, we could be using some of the tools that I'm using here in, um, in Illustrator. Um, and so we'll be making sort of more structured grids as well as a, like optically aligned grids, um, which really means sort of like, a, or I guess I should say improvised grids, which really just means creating a grid system based off of um, the optical patterns of the typography and the design that you're trying to make, as opposed to structuring it around a predetermined grid system. Um, and this was a really difficult a um, little grid to make with my keyboard shortcuts. So I'm gonna just make it blue. All right, so we've got our pretty much finished poster here. Um, and before I say goodbye, again, we're doing this every two weeks. Um, the next session is Tuesday, January 30th, uh, where we'll be talking about typographic structure. Um, make sure you come back to join me for the next live stream session. And also check out Adobe's calendar for the rest of the week. We've got lots and lots of really cool live streams happening all week on Adobe Live, Behance, um, as well as on the Adobe Live YouTube channel. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, my name is Corey Hall, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.